Hey guys! So today I'm going to talk about Berry Curvature effects in condensed matter systems. These are a set of effects that can be explained by appealing to a sort of pseudo-magnetic field in momentum space that pushes electrons into weird paths that you wouldn't have really thought of if you hadn't seen them in the first place. One example of this are the topological edge states that I talked about in a previous VOD, where the Berry Curvature ended up playing the role of a topological invariant. Today, though, I want to talk about a slightly different effect, namely the anomalous Hall effect. This anomalous Hall effect is a close cousin of the related Hall effect, and this is an effect defined with respect to a two-dimensional system of electrically charged particles exposed to a perpendicular magnetic field. If we wanted to move these particles, we'd have to apply an in-plane electric field, or equivalently an in-plane voltage bias. As a result of the Coulomb force, this would push the particles in a direction which is parallel to the applied electric field, but this isn't the only force that they would feel. Since we also have a magnetic field, the Lorentz force also plays a role, and this tends to push particles in a direction which is perpendicular to their velocity vector. The result would be a net buildup of charge on transverse ends of the material, and the resulting voltage can be measured as a Hall voltage. This Hall voltage is directly related to the presence of the magnetic field, and so you'd guess that if you were to turn off this magnetic field, this Hall voltage should go to zero, right? Well, not always. In fact, in a few special materials, a non-zero Hall voltage has been measured even in the absence of a magnetic field. This is called the anomalous Hall effect, and one initial guess you might make in order to attempt to explain it might be that while there's no externally applied magnetic field, there is still some internal magnetic field coming from the motion of the electrons or maybe the spins of the constituent particles. But even this turns out not to be quite right, since this effect has been observed in systems like graphene, where the internal magnetic field is negligible. So what's going on here? Well, to understand this, we'll need to consider quantum mechanical effects. Quantum mechanics as we know extends the notion of a localized point particle to a more non-local, usually sinusoidal wave function. This wave function can of course shift around in space, and the precise value with which it shifts with respect to the origin is called the phase of the wave function. This phase is actually defined as an angle, given by the angle subtended by the distance of the shift on a unit circle. But anyway, if we wanted to get a detailed understanding of the dynamics of this phase, we'd need to appeal to the Schrodinger equation. Fundamentally, this is just an equation which makes the assertion that the energy operator of the system is the generator of time translations on the wave function. And if we wanted to solve it, we'd first need to know what parameters this energy operator depends on. Now, it can of course depend on a few parameters, but in our case, we're just considering the motion of electrically charged particles, and since there's nothing to break the spatial translational invariance, this means that momentum is a good quantum number. So, we can write this energy operator as a function of momentum and solve the Schrodinger equation to obtain a concrete expression for the value of this phase. This expression would contain two terms. The first is what's called the dynamical phase. It's what you may have already seen if you've ever written down the Schrodinger equation in its real space representation and solved using separation of variables. The other is a bit more subtle. It's what's called the Berry phase, and since it depends on the time derivative of the wave function, it only really matters in the special case of some sort of time-dependent adiabatic transport. This isn't too much of a stretch. After all, in experiments, voltage biases are applied, which would induce such transport. But even in this case, it's not immediately obvious that this term even really matters, since you can always do what's called a local U1 gauge transformation to shift this term to zero. This is sort of fancy talk, but suffice it to say that this is generally true, except in the special case for when the adiabatic transport corresponds to a closed path. And this is pretty interesting, because magnetic fields are also associated with closed paths being that the Lorentz force is a centrifugal force which pushes electrons into circular trajectories. So already there seems to be some sort of vague analogy between this Berry phase term and magnetic fields, at least in the weak sense of them both being associated with closed paths. And this intuition is the first hint that this Berry phase term might have something to do with the anomalous Hall effect. So let's think about it a bit more.
First of all, since it really only matters for closed paths, we can absorb the time dependence and rewrite it as a dot product integrated over this closed path. This would give rise to a picture involving a vector field defined over the boundary of some two-dimensional surface. Using Stokes' theorem, we can again rewrite this Berry phase as an integral over this surface, and the relevant vector field in this case would be what's called the Berry curvature. This Berry curvature can be used to define the Berry phase in terms of an integral of its flux, but the really cool thing about it is the effect that it turns out to have on the equations of motion of electrons. To be specific, a thorough analysis will show that this Berry curvature ends up modulating the paths of electrons in exactly the same way that magnetic fields do, except that this Berry curvature is defined over momentum space and isn't a real magnetic field. Nevertheless, it acts exactly like a magnetic field in momentum space, confirming our intuition about this Berry phase term and ultimately providing us exactly what we need in order to explain this anomalous Hall effect. Pretty cool, but we do need to be a bit careful here because we've so far only been considering momentum space locally, whereas the behavior of real materials is of course determined by global effects in momentum space. To understand what I mean by this, remember that we're considering ensembles of electrically charged particles like electrons, each with their own characteristic momentum. When we speak of momentum space, what we really mean is the manifold generated by the set of all allowed momentum values. In two dimensions, this would correspond to a torus, since we'd need to take periodic boundary conditions in both directions in order to account for the edges. But for the sake of simplicity, we can just think in terms of the two-dimensional Euclidean plane. It really doesn't matter because in any case, the Berry curvature that we've been thinking about so far has been with respect to a certain local region of momentum space, corresponding to a particle with its own characteristic momentum. But the behavior of real materials is of course determined by the collective behavior of all particles, not just one or two, and so we need to think about things a bit more generally. So how can we do this? Well, one way would be to consider transformations which take the momentum vector to minus itself. This would be particularly useful to think about because it would end up relating effects on one side of momentum space to the other allowing us to make very general statements about the nature of Berry curvature. In order to accomplish this transformation, remember that the momentum vector is directly proportional to the velocity vector, meaning that it has units involving space divided by time. So, we can apparently accomplish this transformation either by performing a spatial inversion operation, taking the position vector to minus itself, or by performing a time reversal operation, taking time to minus itself. In either of these two cases, we can get a feel for how Berry curvature behaves under these operations by remembering that it's really just a magnetic field in momentum space, allowing us to think more simply in terms of the more familiar magnetic fields. To this end, it helps to have a concrete picture in mind. Consider, for example, an electrically charged particle moving in the counterclockwise direction on a circle, giving rise to a magnetic field that points in the positive z direction, according to the right-hand rule. In the case of the spatial inversion operation, the position of this particle would be transformed across the circle to the other side, changing its position but leaving its counterclockwise chirality intact. The result is that the magnetic field actually doesn't end up changing upon this inversion operation. But what about the time reversal operation? In this case, the position of the particle remains fixed, but the direction of its velocity vector changes sign resulting in a change in chirality from a counterclockwise one to a clockwise one. This results in a corresponding change in the direction of the magnetic field, again according to the right-hand rule. So, while the magnetic field, and by analogy the Berry curvature, remains invariant under an inversion transformation, it apparently changes sign under a time reversal operation. Now, since both of these operations do effectively the same thing in momentum space, and since the Berry curvature is defined over momentum space, this means that the Berry curvature must satisfy both of these conditions simultaneously, resulting in an inconsistency except for the special case for when it's identically equal to zero. And this is kind of unlucky, because the Berry curvature is kind of cool. But we are leaving out one key detail here, which is the role that symmetries play in this picture. 
What I mean by this is that we've so far been assuming that the underlying system of particles is itself unvariant under these operations. And this doesn't always have to be true. Consider, for example, the case of the inversion operation. In this case, as we saw in our prior example, the position of the particle is transformed across the circle, and the fact that this was a symmetry was manifested by the fact that the particle itself didn't change upon this transformation. It remained in the same quantum energy state and didn't look any different. But this assumption can very easily be manipulated by, for example, applying a potential energy difference across the diameter of the circle. This would result in a change in the allowed energy states on opposite ends of the circle, breaking the symmetry between these particles. The result would be a falsification of our originally derived statement that the Berry curvature should be equal to itself under the inversion operation, potentially allowing it to take on non-zero values. However, even if this spatial inversion symmetry can be broken, it turns out that time reversal symmetry can't be. The reason for this is that time reversal symmetry is actually an innate symmetry of most condensed matter systems, and can only artificially be broken by the application of a real magnetic field. Since we're considering the anomalous Hall effect in the absence of either external or internal magnetic fields, this means that time reversal symmetry must remain. So, while the breaking of spatial inversion symmetry might give rise to a non-zero value of Berry curvature, the preservation of time reversal symmetry mandates that it must still be an odd function of momentum, meaning that its net sum still goes to zero. The only way around this would be to populate the particles themselves more heavily on one side of momentum space than the other, so that, for example, the net positive contribution of Berry curvature outweighs the net negative one. This would correspond to a non-equilibrium distribution of particles, and can be achieved, for example, by applying a large enough in-plane electric field on the material. So this is pretty cool. What this means is that the result of all these interesting theoretical considerations is to give us a recipe that we can use to look for non-trivial Berry curvature effects. The first thing we need to do would be to break inversion symmetry, so that the Berry curvature isn't identically zero. After that, we need to probe non-equilibrium physics, so that the sum of Berry curvature is also not equal to zero. Sounds pretty simple, right? So let's see how this can be done on, for example, the relatively simple case of graphene. Graphene, as we may already know by now, is a single atomic layer of graphite, consisting of a whole lot of carbon atoms arranged hexagonally in the plane. Looking at an individual unit cell of its lattice makes it fairly straightforward to see that graphene actually does obey inversion symmetry, since performing the inversion operation would exchange carbon atoms, bringing the lattice right back to itself. So, if we want to observe non-trivial Berry curvature effects in graphene, we'd first need to break its inversion symmetry, and this can be done in a few ways. One way might be to place graphene on top of another material, which also has a hexagonal structure but whose neighboring atoms are different, as is in the case in, for example, hexagonal boron nitride. In this case, the carbon atoms of graphene would be exposed to a spatially varying electrostatic potential, which would break inversion symmetry in the more energetic way that we talked about earlier. However, perhaps a more interesting way of doing it might be simply to apply strain to the material stretching apart its atoms and breaking inversion symmetry in a more straightforward geometric way. The reason that I called this more interesting is because of the nature of Berry curvature that could be induced using this method. To be specific, detailed theoretical calculations show that the Berry curvature in this case could take the form of what's called a Berry curvature dipole, emulating a magnetic dipole and giving rise to precisely calculable effects. In particular, in the presence of an oscillating in-plane electric field, this Berry curvature dipole can be shown not only to give rise to a non-zero Hall voltage, as expected since the Berry curvature emulates a magnetic field, but also to a somewhat unusual non-linear Hall effect, defined at twice the input electric field frequency. This is interesting, and ultimately gives us something to look for if we wanted to test our predictions about this Berry curvature. And what do you know? This is exactly what was observed in a strained bilayer graphene system probed in its non-equilibrium state. In fact, this effect has been observed in a whole bunch of materials ranging from tungsten diselenide to molybdenum disulfide, ultimately providing pretty good evidence that these Berry curvature effects are, well, real.
And this is super awesome, because you'll remember that this Berry curvature fundamentally came from the dynamics of the phase associated with somewhat abstract quantum mechanical waves. So, the fact that we can observe these effects in reality in fairly common materials really rams home the point that these seemingly abstract quantum mechanical waves can have a real, tangible effect on reality. Thanks so much for watching guys, I hope you found this as cool as I did, let me know what you think and I'll see you guys next time, ciao!